as the North Koreans have suggested very explicitly in their public statements, that there will be more provocations coming. The pivot's a lot of sizzle, not a lot of steak. This is the Spotlight Asia podcast. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming um, to our Public Health in Asia event series. Um, our talk today is on Chern Chernobyl and Fukushima. Uh, and our guest speaker is Timothy Musso. Uh, he is a professor of biological sciences at the University of South Carolina. His former positions include associate vice president for research, dean of the graduate school, and program officer for population biology at the US National Science Foundation. He recently served on the National Academy of Science Committee to exa examine uh, the incidence of cancer near nuclear power plants. His research is concerned with the ecology and evolution of animals and plants with a special interest in how adaptations uh, to changing environments evolve in natural populations. Since 2000, he has studied the impacts of radioactive fallout from the Chernobyl disaster on natural populations of birds insects, plants, and microbes with more than 40 scientific publications on this topic since 2005. More recently, he traveled to Fukushima, Japan to study the impacts of the high radiation levels found in this region. His research combines field ecological surveys with advanced laboratory technologies including gen genomics, genomics all right. <laughs> cytogenetics, uh, quantitative genetics, radio telemetry, and advanced statistical methods to discover and understand the mechanisms underlying variation among individuals in their sensitivity to radioactive contaminants. And as I just found out, he is a fellow dual citizen uh, of Canada, so did his undergrad at the University of Toronto, his graduate work at McGill University. Um, so with that, I turn it over to you. Thank well, you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. It really is nice to be here. I've been spending a lot of time in Washington in the last year and a half or so. And uh, it's, it really is a wonderful place to live and work and visit, uh, especially when the weather's a little nicer. But anyway, uh, so today, uh, as most of you probably realize, this, is the, this week marks the second anniversary of the Fukushima disaster, March 11th. And there's been quite a bit of interest in the topic uh, as a consequence. Next month, we'll have the 27th anniversary of the Chernobyl disaster. And, and so, uh, yeah, this time of the year, uh, I get a lot of requests to come visit people and give, and give lectures. Uh, and so, yeah, it really is wonderful to be here. Uh, just wanted to, this first slide here is really just to remind me to acknowledge that, uh, the, work, that the work I'll be talking about today is, is really the product of large collaboration with many, many more people than listed here, but these are my principal partners, especially uh, Andre Moller at the University of Paris South. So, uh, and uh, one thing I want you to note that's relevant today, perhaps, for the discussion is that uh, I don't have any Japanese colleagues listed on this slide, even though we have uh, about a dozen or so Japanese collaborators who have been quite active and involved in the work, you can see who they are by looking at some of our publications, but they're, uh, they're, they're, they're quite um, concerned about having their names publicly displayed in association with anything related to Fukushima at this point. Uh, there's, uh, especially the younger people who think that this might affect their chances at jobs. And I think there's a, actually I was talking to somebody from Woods Hole who'd done some of the pioneering work on the Marine Coast side of, of Fukushima uh, earlier this week, and he had the same issue with several of his Japanese colleagues not wanting to be publicly listed in uh, the work that they were doing. So I think there's a lot of self-censorship going on with respect to the scientific and health research that's going on in Fukushima at the moment, and, and this is a, a, a concern. Uh, the other point to this slide is to acknowledge the, the funding the supporters that we have, especially the, the Center for Human Charitable Trust. All right, let me see here. So as, as Perhaps some of you have seen this slide before. Here's a map of uh, the Fukushima fallout. Uh, and this, this, this map's kind of interesting uh, from, from a socio-political perspective. This map is, was generated through citizen scientists. This was uh, generated using readings conducted by citizens who took a, the radiation measurement and, and, and uploaded it to a common map. And this was, these were the first maps, actually, that were available shortly after the disaster. And you can see the sort of pattern of, of, of very serious contamination up here in Fukushima, prefecture. And you can also see that there are areas in northern Tokyo 
that are relatively um, significantly contaminated. We don't know what, what that will mean in the long term, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Here's a close-up of Fukushima Prefecture showing the hottest areas. And uh, of note here are the towns of Fukushima City and Koryama, each having about 300,000 people. And, um, and these little blue squiggles are the areas that we've done most of our research uh, in the last couple of years, or a year and a half. And it's, uh, I think it's worth, it's worth noting that you know, these towns of Fukushima and Koryama, each with about 300,000 people, they're in areas that are relatively significantly contaminated. One thing I should start off by mentioning is if you have questions, if I'm missing something, uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, this is a small group. I think we can, we can be quite interactive if we want to be. A really good question. Yeah. Um, what is the scale that we're measuring on? Like how, how, yeah. how much yeah, so, greater is red than blue, per se? Oh, how much red, how much more contaminated? Yeah, exactly. Well, what, what is the scale? Of yeah, so, uh, so this right here, this, this light blue here, is uh, about the same as the background radiation here in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. pretty low. Uh, and this area right here is about, uh, it's over 100 microsieverts per hour, mm -hmm. which is um, 100 times, a little bit more than 100 times what we would consider normally acceptable exposure rates for people living in areas. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's worth noting that large parts of Fukushima City and Koryama City are uh, between one and five microsieverts per hour. And again, sort of one microsievert per hour is sort of what we would consider to be a significant level of contamination. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty concerning what health impacts that level might have in the, in the long term. Mm -hmm. Some people say none, other people say a lot, probably somewhere in the middle, uh, but it's certainly worth uh, paying attention to. What most of you in this room probably haven't seen before is this map of the Chernobyl contamination. Can you all see that one back there? It's, uh, here's Chernobyl. Actually, this arrow got messed up in the transition from Mac to PC. But anyway, <laughs> here's the Chernobyl reactor. These are the areas of very high contamination, comparable to the hottest parts of Fukushima. But what's really interesting about this map is that, and that we don't hear much about, vast areas of Europe we're also heavily contaminated. And, uh, and, and we're now, you know, 27 years later, starting to see some significant health uh, implications of that chronic exposure related to that as well. Uh, another point of, of note is that the Chernobyl event was perhaps, in terms of terrestrial impacts on the landmass, on people, probably you know, on the order of 10 times the size of, of Fukushima. So that's the good news for Fukushima. It's, it's probably on the order of one tenth of what Chernobyl was. And uh, this is just to show you one of, one of the key, from a scientific perspective, and I do apologize to the non scientists in the room, I'm going to be showing a few graphs and things like that. Um, hopefully, we'll walk you through them. But uh, the, uh, one, of the, one of the key points from a scientific perspective. Of use from a scientific perspective is the fact that the fallout from both Fukushima and Chernobyl, but especially Chernobyl, was highly heterogeneous. So you notice this is a close up of northern Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia showing the main areas of contamination. And, and what you'll notice is that it's, it's really patchy. You have areas of hot and cold reflecting this, this patchy fallout, mainly from that, that stemmed from the wind patterns and where it was raining. Uh, in Chernobyl, the fallout lasted for, or the, the, the emissions from the reactor went on for about 10 days, and, and so the, the wind changed each day, and, and you know, it rained in different places. And so you see these different areas of high contamination. From a scientific perspective, this is very useful, because what it allows us to do is to compare hot and cold areas over here to hot and cold areas over, over here, hot and cold over here, so we can replicate our studies of the impacts animal health, essentially. And actually, if you zoom in on the Chernobyl exclusion zone even closer, here's the exclusion zone that has a big fence around it. No people. Highly contaminated in some areas. But this area right here, for instance, 
That's about the same as it is here in downtown Washington. Very, very, very low background radiation levels in some parts of the zone. So inside the zone is a mix of hot and cold. The fence really is just because I had to put a fence someplace. And, uh, and so this, again, provides a really useful tool for the sorts of studies we want to do. All right, so um, um, there are some people who might ask this question. OK, you've had a disaster. Why bother to study and the effects on animal populations to live in Fukushima and Chernobyl? And prior to two years ago, <laughs> uh, you know, I had to preface my talk with, with a short discussion of nuclear power and the uh, sorts of things that are associated with nuclear, nuclear energy generation. And the first is that there are a lot of nuclear power plants around the world. There are over 400. Uh, plus or minus, I guess it's down below 400 right now if you consider the uh, 50 of the 54 reactors in, in uh, Japan are offline at the moment. But uh, there are quite a few, and they all have huge stockpiles of spent fuel sitting on site because we still have not dealt with the issue of what to do with the spent nuclear fuel. So this is all dispersed around the country, around the world. Uh, we're still building nu nuclear power plants, especially in Asia, especially in, in China. Uh, and uh, here in the U.S., we have four new reactors going in within 60 miles of where I live in, in Columbia, South Carolina. And, uh, the, uh, and, and, and there's plans for some in this general area, although some of those plans have been put on hold temporarily, at least, until we decide, until we figure out what to do with all that spent fuel. Uh, that's been kind of a block on, on future development for the moment. Um, this is what construction site looks like. This is a, one of my poet photos of uh, from last month from the BC summer plant just up the road from where I live. And uh, here's another one of the Bogle plant right on the border of South Carolina and Georgia. And, and all the, the new reactors are all going in where there are old reactors as well. And, and one of the, you know, the key points to this picture is that, and we'll Here's a, here's a shot of the Mox plant in Savannah Riverside, which is another multi-billion dollar project. So in South Carolina, in the vicinity of South Carolina, we have about $30 billion in nuclear projects going on. So what do you think the local governments think about these projects? They love them. They love them. You know, we're talking thousands of jobs, at least temporarily, major construction sites. Uh, and, uh, so this, in general, this is, this is well appreciated uh, by, by the population as well. Although those of us who are paying 37% more on our electric bills to, to finance them, we're, I'm not so happy about it when I get my electric bill every month, but that's another issue. So anyway, and, and, and there are many people living next to these power plants. Um, one point I wanted to make is that um, there's still a lot we don't know about what happens to the emissions from these power plants. One, one, one thing I learned a couple of years, but in the last two years as I've been working on this National Academy panel, is that even every nuclear power plant generates, like every industrial complex, generates effluent, radioactive effluent, by design. It has to, and it has to eliminate it. And, and nuclear engineers have spent a lot of time designing systems to reduce these affluents and to dilute these affluents uh, so that they don't get too concentrated, uh, so that they're released in ways that, that shouldn't affect the population surrounding them. And, uh, but, but the point of this graph, and you really can't see it, but it's just to show that there's really a huge, huge amount of these radioactive affluents being released. Uh, and, uh, and of different kinds. The previous slide was for tritium, which is radioactive water, which is released by all these plants, more or less. Uh, this is, uh, these are noble gases. These are gases that are sort of, that waft out from the plant. Uh, some of them are highly, highly radioactive, and there's enormous quantities of it produced. It's just a natural byproduct of the fission process, uh, and there's no way to really deal with it. They have, the engineers have come up with ways to minimize uh, the amounts of, of materials, and I think one point of this particular graph here, and again, it's kind of hard to see, uh, the red bars are what are being emitted now, and the blue bars are what were emitted 20, 30 years ago. And so we, 
you know, the engineers have come a long ways towards minimizing, reducing the amounts of effluents that are produced. But the point of this slide is to show you that there are still millions and millions of curies produced. <laughs> you know, that doesn't really mean much, I know. But uh, there's a lot of radioactivity generated by these plants and by virtue of the fact that we have lots of these plants running, um, it, it's out there. But we don't really know what, what the, the long-term impacts might be, if any. Um, but those were the regulated effluents. Those were the effluents that these companies are, are permitted to release. It turns out we've been discovering, especially in the last couple of years, and a lot of the interest in recent years in this question has come from the fact that we're starting to we occasionally find that there are unregulated releases from these power plants. That means leaks that nobody was expecting. And uh, so a couple of years ago, we discovered that probably half of our reactor sites, power plant sites in that order, are leaking significant amounts of radioactive water uh, beyond the site of the nuclear power plant. One thing we did learn, uh, I was on a panel to review the data, we don't know what, what, what impacts these effluents might have. It's very likely that they have little or no impacts because we're talking relatively small amounts. But the truth is they are leaking. Uh, we don't catch them very often. It's very expensive to do the sorts of monitoring uh, at all of these plants that would be necessary to really rule out uh, the impacts. And so uh, not a whole lot is done uh, except when by chance somebody discovers a major leak. The Vermont Yankee plant was particularly interesting in that uh, <laughs> when they discovered this major plume of radioactive water, tritium leaking off this plant site, they, uh, um, they went to find the leak. They wanted to go find the leak so they could patch it up. And they couldn't tell where it was because all the pipes were underground. And there was no schematic of where the pipes were because it was built prior to when this was required by, by, by law. And so it took them a lot of money and effort to, to, to dig it all up and find where these leaks were and patch it up. All right, so anyway, uh, a couple years ago, the Na Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, commissioned the National Academy of Sciences to do a uh, sort of an analysis of whether or not we could actually uh, determine what the health consequences might be, especially with respect to cancer uh, of, these, the, of these power plants. There had been a study done in the early 90s, but it was a very, very crude epidemiological analysis, uh, primarily because of the lack of good registry data or fine resolution registry data uh, for the people living in the area. And, and so it was really, even though the formal conclusion was that there was no obvious effects on cancer rates of nuclear power plants. Really, if you asked any epidemiologist, they would tell you that there was no way that they could ever have asked that question or address that question with any resolution, simply because uh, of the uh, lack of fine scale data. So they asked us to uh, determine the feasibility. And, and the first thing we did was to review the literature, mainly from Europe in recent years. And uh, if you go through the literature, there's been a whole bunch of studies done in Europe in the last 10 years, primarily. If you go through that literature, what you're going to find is that in almost all cases where there is sufficient resolution, there's an apparent doubling of cancer risk to young children in the form of leukemia uh, if, if they live within three miles of the power plant. And so, a lot of these studies were not really statistically very strong, simply because there weren't a lot of people there, or uh, you know, just it, not just insufficient data really to get at it carefully. But anyway, the outcome of this review and our on our analysis was that we would continue forward, and uh, hopefully, uh, we'll be you'll be hearing more about this in the coming months uh, with the National Academy uh, moving forward with the pilot study using much better data. Hopefully, this time. And of course, the other risk from nuclear power plants that's come up in recent years is, of course, the notion of nuclear terrorism. Uh, I don't know if you folks have thought about that, but some, some folks who do this for a living have suggested that, that it's very, very likely that, uh, that a nuclear power plant will be a target for, for a terrorist attack at some point. And of course, there may not be any health risks associated with 
with a bomb going off at a, at a power plant, but there certainly will be uh, a lot of economic uh, consequences. All right. One last point before I move on to some, some gruesome pictures of the birds. Uh, is, uh, <clears throat> so again, um, in terms of the risks and hazards, so we had about 600 nuclear power plants around the world since the beginning of time, commercial nuclear power plants. And we've had three major events at these power plants, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and now Fukushima. So that's three out of 600 approximately, one out of 200. You know, the, you know, the, the risk analysis folks will question my, my mathematics, my statistics. But to me, that's a one in 200 frequency. And, uh, you know, so the question you have to ask yourself is, would you get on an airplane to London for a show if there was a one in 200 chance that the airplane wouldn't make it? Uh, so again, the, uh, the issue is just how safe is it relative to the benefits. So what, let me get back to Chernobyl and that, that's sort of my prelude. <laughs> I'm going to right through the, the rest of it. So uh, about just over 10 years ago, I started to get very interested in uh, the ecological consequences of this Chernobyl disaster. And uh, simply because if you want to look at what the health and environmental impacts of nuclear power might be, it's going to be very, very difficult to study these effects around nuclear power plants because the effluents are very low. Uh, and so if there is any effect, it's going to be very small and would require enormous or enormously detailed studies to get at. So if you go to Chernobyl, where the effluent, where the radioactive contaminants are very high, uh, then you have a much better chance of determining whether or not there are any consequences for the wildlife in the area. Uh, we were particularly motivated, as evolutionary biologists, evolutionary geneticists, we were very motivated by, by this, this statement by the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency Chernobyl Forum, which was released in the mid-2000s. They suggested that the populations around, of plants and animals around the Chernobyl zone were actually thriving, that there were moose, deer, and wild boar, and rare and endangered species everywhere, because there's this big fence, and then by implication, of course, what's the take home message from such a statement? That there couldn't be any effect of these contaminants, right? If, the effect of the, if there are an effect of contaminants, it's nothing compared to the effect of people directly impacting. And, and this, they left this hanging up there. That's a direct quote. They also suggested from this report that, that much of the human illness in the area was a direct consequence of psychological stress rather than uh, any direct effects of radiation. And, and, and of course, you're seeing this in Japan right now. There's an enormous pressure uh, by NGOs, <coughs> UN agencies, WHO, uh, which just released a report last week uh, in time for the second anniversary, to suggest that don't worry about the potential direct health consequences. They're, they're probably nothing probably next to zero. It's what's much more important in terms of human health are the psychological stress impacts. And we all know that psychological stress can lead to illness. That's, there's no doubt about that. But uh, it's not good science to be suggesting that that's the only cause. Uh, and, and in the case of, of the animal, plant and animal populations, there was no data to support this, this idea. They just threw it out there. Anyway, we were quite interested. Uh, the fact that there was no data gave us motivation to go there and oh yeah and, and of course the media picked up on this how many of you in this room have heard that the Chernobyl zone is a thriving ecosystem with lots of plants and animals yeah you know it's, it's really the dominant uh, you know sentiment perpetuated by the media perpetuated by a number of different groups and, and so you see it in the media like this uh, and so this this really we were as evolutionary biologists we were very interested in going to see if there were Actually, the animals were actually evolving adaptations to surviving in these habitats. And if you go to the Chernobyl, you know, the most contaminated areas look like this, sort of a desert, uh, dead trees, only a few grasses growing, a few birch. The pine trees don't survive in these hottest areas. But if you go a little bit further away from these hottest areas, 
you start to see, you know, some animals, some nice cute birds, and mice, insects, and you see the occasional moose, and uh, uh, Chabelsky's horses here. Uh, I'm sorry, these are an endangered species of horse, the progenitor to the modern domestic horse. They released a bunch into the zone. They thought this would be a nice, wonderful place to put these horses. This is an endangered species, actually extinct in the wild, but uh, anyway, uh, put them there. And actually, you know, a few people, uh, one of, somebody who used to work for me in Chernobyl, uh, published a few of his photos of the Chernobyl zone just a couple weeks ago in Slate magazine. Again, promoting this notion that it's a thriving ecosystem. Here's some, some wild boar, uh, and uh, here's a, uh, an eagle, and a uh, young elk, and uh, you know, oh, here's another promotional photo of the horses in front of the reactor. Uh, you know, what's the message from <coughs> that? Oh, here's one of my photos. They're, they're handsome beasts, by the way. They, they really are fun to, to look at. And oh, here's a poster from a building in the town of Chernobyl. Again, promoting the notion of you know the wildlife sitting on. Anybody know what these are? Photon fuel core, okay. fuel rods, <laughs> nuclear fuel rods. Here's our atomic reaction <laughs> going on here. You know, it's an abstract painting, right? We've got all those birds on it. So this notion that nuclear and and wildlife are compatible. Anyway, so. The absence of data was being used to suggest that everything was fine in the Chernobyl zone, but there just really wasn't, and that's not good science. So we went back, um, we now have our Chernobyl Plus Fukushima Research Initiative, and we're mainly interested in the studies of birds and plants and animals, but we're also doing some work with children in the area. As biologists, the sorts of questions we ask are a little bit different than what maybe nuclear industry folks or energy industry folks might be asking. We're interested in documenting whether or not there are any effects on mutation rates. And if there are mutations, are there increased <coughs> incidences of you know, tumors and developmental abnormalities, the sorts of things that you hear about associated with that. But even, you know, even if there are mutations and they have some effects, maybe they don't matter in terms of survival and reproduction of these organisms. So you know, what, what are the effects on survival and reproduction? And finally, uh, if there are effects on survival and reproduction, do we see any higher level of ecological consequences uh, related to the damage, damage to the ecosystem, the injury to the ecosystem? And this, you're not expected to read, it's just a, it's just a list of our recent papers. Uh, and, and because I never get to the end of my talks usually, because uh, usually there's questions being thrown at me, but uh, uh, the punchlines are these. And, uh, and then we can go through a few of them if we have time, as we have time. The first punchline is, oh my goodness, every organism we've looked at, every group of organisms we've looked at, show very strong evidence for genetic damage in direct proportion to the amount of radiation that they're exposed to. Second punchline, every organism that we've looked at <coughs> shows evidence uh, visible mutations and abnormalities, uh, and I'll pass around some, some photos, developmental abnormalities related to the exposure <coughs> to the contaminants. Many of the organisms are incapable of reproducing. In the hottest areas, uh, we found 40% of the males have no sperm. They've lost their ability to generate sperm, and if you can't produce sperm, you're not much good as a male. Uh, and so, uh, and then there's also uh, in, in effects on fertility in females as well. Many of the species that we've been able to work with some detail on have reduced lifespans. They don't live as long. Now, let's see. And, and, and as a consequence of reduced fertility and reduced lifespan, we see in the hotter areas, many fewer organisms overall. So the abundances of many groups of organisms are dramatically lower in these hot areas than in the clean areas. And finally, this leads to losses of biodiversity as well. So major injury to the ecosystem in the area, and the, the level of injury is directly proportional to, to the level of contamination. Uh, these last two points, I'm not sure. Uh, we 
probably we won't have too much time. We won't have time to talk about them. But but the first, you know, I think they're the most important points, and they, they, they apply equally to Fukushima. And one of the, the the amazing ironies of what we found is that it is precisely because it is low levels of radiation, radioactive contaminants, levels that are so low that they don't generally kill the organisms very quickly. In fact, many of the organisms live long enough to reproduce, although many of them don't, but, but enough of them do, especially in the areas that are only moderately contaminated. But they live long enough and, and reproduce well enough to pass these mutations on to the next generation. And the next generation is also exposed to these low levels of contaminants. And so mutations accumulate over generations. It's sort of a bioaccumulation of mutation, mutational load. So from an evolutionary standpoint, this is really quite uh, interesting. And we see this in a number of ways, uh, both directly by looking at the amount of genetic damage but also by comparing Fukushima to Chernobyl. Fukushima happened two years ago, Chernobyl 27 years ago, and the differences we see in genetic damage uh, appear to be reflected in the, in, in, as a result of this mutation accumulation over multiple generations. So that's the first sort of major point. The second major point is that these a lot of these animals move. Even the plants move. <laughs> they don't walk, though. Uh, but, but of course, the pollen is spread and the seeds are spread, so they do move. And we're seeing evidence of these mutations beyond the areas of contamination. So this mutational load gets transmitted beyond into, into areas that are relatively clean. And so I think these are the two most important sort of conclusions overall. Let's go through a few other details. So I get this question, do you see any three-headed monsters? And, and of course you don't. You, know, you don't see that kind of, of that level of, of, of mutational effects. Why not? Why don't you see three-headed monsters? I think so many generations of developing mutation that severe. So I mean, I don't like think that's the answer, actually. Okay. Uh, although that, you know, I, clearly more generations increase the probability <coughs> of recessive mutations coming together from mother and father, mm -hmm. so so it's you know often these mutations. So many of these kinds of mutations are actually what we call recessive. Mm -hmm. They're not expressed if you just have one copy. Yeah. But if you have two copies, one from mom, one from dad, put it together, then it's expressed in the offspring. Mm -hmm. So it's related to that, but uh, but there are other reasons. Well, I, I wouldn't see it more likely to get one messed in trait <clears throat> rather than a whole working system like a head um, attached to. And from that, it would die. Yeah. You wouldn't yeah. see it because it would be dead. Uh, it wouldn't have, it would probably wouldn't have finished development. So major mutations, first of all, most mutations tend to be recessive, so you don't see them until they come together. Secondly, any, any dominant mutation which has a large effect leads to the, the death of the individual carrying it very often. Uh, and so you just don't see it. And the third reason is that when animals die in the wild, you, rare, you, know, you just don't see them usually. They, they die, they get eaten, they get decomposed. So it's very unusual to actually see those kinds of things. There are a few strange abnormalities expressed, but, but again, the, the probability of finding them is very low. Um, anyway, so, but we do find lots of more subtle things uh, in some of these pictures that I've passed around. Here's what, what the site looks like. Here's the cooling pond. Uh, these are this is some of the cooling towers from reactors five and six. Uh, Nice scenic place. This is where I go to vacation, you know. <laughs> uh, any, any fishermen in the audience? Uh, anybody recognize this guy to the left of me? Yeah. Anyway, this is uh, Jeremy Wade from River Monsters. They came up to, to, to watch us uh, catch birds. Here's a little radioactive robin. Uh, most of our work we do with, with animals, and one of the reasons we use animal models for studies of potential health effects <coughs> is because I've never seen a barn swallow drinking, smoking, or getting depressed. And, uh, although I guess, you know, if this guy doesn't find a mate, he might get a little bit depressed. But the, uh, in general, 
Uh, we don't have to worry about those kinds of complications, which have been used a lot in Ukraine to, to you know, explain some of the health consequences. So the first thing we, we when we went up there and started catching birds and looking at them in some detail, the first thing we noticed were these strange color patterns. And so in this case, this is a normal male here with a dark reddish uh, coloration on the throat and the top of the head. Here's a male that's gone very pale, uh, very unusual, rarely seen anywhere else. Here's another kind of image of this. Again, big patches of white feathers where the, the melanocytes, the cells that are responsible for coloration, were, have died. Uh, it's inherited. Uh, if, if they do manage to attract a mate, they are passed on, but they're not nearly as good as attracting females because females use the intensity of this coloration to choose mates as one of the characters. So this guy, even though he survived, his biological fitness is likely to be not so good. This is an interesting photo. This is a photo I just got in a few days ago from Japan, uh, from Fukushima area. These are some barn swallows. Here's some young chicks here. Here's a uh, female. You see these little patches of white? You can sort of see them here. This, these are the sorts of things we first started to see in Chernobyl. Again, suggesting that we're starting to see some of the same kinds of aberrations in Fukushima. Strange development of tail feathers, again, not really. Very, very unusual to see this kind of asymmetry in shape. Uh, tumors at a low frequency often around the head and on the feet. Uh, again, you know, you, this is a very unusual uh, beak lip for, for a bird. Uh, here's another tumor around the eye. There's a normal one over here. There's a tumor around the head of another species. So we see it in all different species. Uh, we see these patches of strange, unusual white feathers in lots of different species. Very, very anomalous, and some really gross things too. Uh, you know, growth on the wing in this case, uh, some kind of tumor. Nasty. Uh, here's some very unusual growth around the uh, around the rear end of the bird, uh, just never seen before. Only ever seen in these contaminated areas. Clearly uh, related to the exposure, and actually, yeah, again, you can't see this. And it's not really an interesting graph, it's a logistic regression. And it just basically shows highly significant increases in the frequencies of these weird developmental abnormalities in the more contaminated areas. So we, we continued our work uh, a couple of years ago. We compiled our work on brain size in the birds. <laughs> and part of this was <coughs> excuse me, motivated by observations of increased rates of neurological developmental problems in children living in these areas, which had been written off as <coughs> fetal alcohol syndrome. Because there's big problems with alcoholism in, in this part of the world. And, and uh, so we started measuring the birds' brains in these populations and, uh, and discovered that Chernobyl birds have about 5% smaller brains on average, uh, which is very significant if you're a bird. And uh, the, uh, this, this got us into a fair bit of trouble because, of course, uh, as soon as our Ukrainian colleagues in, working in Chernobyl Zone saw this, they called us up and said, does this mean our brains are smaller too? And, and, and you know, if you look at the children, the data on neurological developmental problems in children, uh, it's certainly uh, consistent. And the other, the other interesting thing is that, of course, the, the, the birds with smaller brains have a reduced probability of surviving from one year to the next. So if you look at, uh, if you compare, basically the, the, the birds that have relatively small brains have a much reduced probability of making it through to the next year. So it implies that there are cognitive consequences. And uh, we see similar cognitive effects in some of the human populations in terms of children in Scandinavia who were in, in utero during the 1986 event uh, have lower IQ scores, lower school performance, and you know it's all very subtle. You know you can't, you wouldn't. It's not really obvious, but if you do the statistics, do the epidemiology, it's real. Uh, another another study uh, recently accepted for publication 
uh, again, uh, motivated by some of the observations for human populations. In these Chernobyl birds, we see, again, a, a much higher frequency of, of opacities and cataracts in, in the eyes, and another development of abnormalities around the eyes, uh, consistent with what is seen with some of the human populations. Uh, and it's not just the animals. Uh, this is a uh, stunted or dwarfed uh, Scots pine. Now, normally Scots pines are absolutely straight up and down. And, <laughs> and here in this area right here, this is, this is an area of about 35, 40 microsieverts per hour. The pines don't use, won't grow here. They were killed off in this area that, that uh, they, they were growing here before, but after the, the, the disaster, the radiation levels in this area exceeded. Well, in this case, it's I mean, yeah, 35, 40 microsieverts per hour. They haven't come back except for a few of these little stunted things. Basically, the growing tip of the tree dies off every year as a result of the exposure. Uh, and it's well known that Scots pines, pines in general, are more sensitive to radiation than most other species. Some of the birds have come back. But here's another, uh, here's another area of more where the trees were a little more mature at the time of the event. And again, you see these very strange growth forms, again, representing, re reflecting uh, both uh, genetic mutations and the, the, the death of the apical growing stem of the trees at the time. And you only see this in the areas of high contamination. And it's not just plants and birds, but also some of the insects. Here's a, another, this is a fire bug. Can you see the face mask? Does this look like an African yeah. face mask to you? Yeah, it's what sort of struck me, you know, the eyes, the nose. And uh, the, uh, we were, we were doing some bird work, and actually we were collecting pollen from flowers, and uh, one of my colleagues looked down and he said, look, there's a, there's a mutant fire bug. And, and so we started collecting them in areas of different contamination levels. And oh my god, you know, the, the frequency, uh, because it's so easy to see them, just because of the space mask kind of thing, you, you really can, can visualize the variation. Uh, you know, this one's missing an eye, this one's got an eye patch, <laughs> and, you know, developmental things. Uh, the frequency of these kinds of aberrations are uh, much higher in the contaminated areas. And what's really interesting is in the spring, when they first all emerge, the frequency of these abnormalities is much higher. And as the season goes on, as they have subsequent generations, it, it looks, the numbers reduce as a result of selection against these critters. And then back in the spring, they go back up again. Uh, let's see. Sperm, the males deformed about 40% of the sperm in uh, these barn swallows deformed, and about 40%, 43%, no, sorry, uh, just over, uh, just under 40% of the males are sterile in the most contaminated areas. And let me just skip ahead because I'm running out of time. The, the basic, usually I start with these slides, but today I thought I could do the pictures first. Um, mainly to, to, you know, in response to some of the suggestions by the, in the media and elsewhere that this Chernobyl zone is this thriving ecosystem overrun with animals, we decided to actually test that idea directly by counting all the animals in a very systematic way. And when you do this, and so we went to actually not, almost 900 different places in Chernobyl, in Ukraine, and Belarus, and a total of 700 uh, counts in Fukushima in the last two years. When you do this, what you find is very clear. There are many, many fewer animals in these areas of high contamination. So in the case of bumblebees, almost none in these higher areas. In the case of butterflies, again, almost none in the highest areas. Spiders in Chernobyl disappear. Grasshoppers. Grasshoppers are a little tougher. There's a few more of them, but they still drop off dramatically. Uh, dragonflies, almost completely in Chernobyl. And of course, the other qu the question that everybody has is, what happens to these critters? Anybody know what this footprint is? Yeah, it's, it's 
the wolf brain. So what happens to the mammals, which of course is what people talk about all the time. Here's, here's our putative wolf. I don't think that's a wolf, I think it's a dog. It's a hybrid, but anyway. When you do the counts, the mammals drop off as well, as do the rodents as they grow. Uh, so, you know, in fact, you may have heard in the news that the Ukrainian government was trying to open the Chernobyl zone as a tourist spot. They, they, were, they were bringing in busloads of tourists to show them the zone. Of course, what did they want to see? They wanted to see all these animals that, that people were talking about. But you almost never see a large animal inside the zone. And so what did they do? They set up a zoo in the town of Chernobyl. So here we have, here we have a wolf, a BBC reporter taking some video of this Chernobyl wolf that had been caught and put in a cage. And of course, the birds drop off dramatically. Uh, the, the abundances are down by about two thirds, and the biodiversity is down to less than half. And so, um, I think after the result of publishing a bunch of papers on this topic, uh, we've convinced a few people at least that it isn't this biological evil uh, that people have been talking about using real data. So, what about Fukushima, the topic of today? So, uh, July 2011, we went off to Fukushima and uh, basically repeated the studies that we've been doing in Chernobyl in much the same way. Here's a barn swallow ringing the alarm bell in <laughs> radiation. And also done a lot of work with the insects, collected the insects to look for genetic damage. And also pollen in the flowers. And we've written a few papers now uh, related to this. And the bottom line is we see similarities and differences. With respect to the birds, we see the same patterns, uh, a major drop off in the abundance and biodiversity. And if we compare this, the, it turns out that Chernobyl and Fukushima have many common species, species in common. There's 14 species of bird in the two censuses that are the same. And we, if we compare those two groups, that, that's the same group across the two places. Uh, the strength of the relationship with radiation is twice as strong in Fukushima, implying that they're dropping off at about twice the rate. And the question is, you know, why? What's that about? And uh, one suggestion was that maybe in Chernobyl, 27 years later, they had a chance to adapt to the radiation. I don't think that's it. What what it probably reflects more is that in Fukushima they've never seen radiation. So these individuals that are particularly sensitive are dropping off. Those individuals are long gone in the Chernobyl environment. And if you look at the other critters, uh, you, know, you can't read that at all. But the basic point is that in Fukushima we see bird effects on birds, we see effects on butterflies, but we don't see any effects on the other groups just yet. But if we go to the second year, we're seeing that the effects are getting stronger, at least on the birds, and than they were in the first year. So uh, the, the basic message is that we need to continue doing the research in this area. It's clear that there are significant impacts in, of contamination in Fukushima, but they're different than what we're seeing in Chernobyl uh, in terms of the sensitivities of different groups. And this could reflect the different kinds of radioactive contaminants that were released. In Fukushima, we see mainly the effects of radioactive cesium, whereas in Chernobyl, we have cesium and strontium and plutonium and americium and some other stuff uh, that may be particularly, maybe more hazardous to the organisms living there. Uh, so it's, quite, it's possible that in Fukushima, we won't see the same kinds of uh, ecological damage that, uh, or injury that we've seen uh, in, in Chernobyl just because of those differences. But we won't know if we don't do the research. And at this point, there's been almost no support for research in Fukushima. As far as I can tell, apart from one or two other Japanese groups who've been, again, working on their own dime with no funding from the Japanese government, uh, we're the only other group doing this kind of work. And, and we're also doing it mostly on our own dime or with some grant funding from independent uh, foundations. But um, 
but there's not been a lot of uh, government support. So that really, uh, you know, the real, the main message is that there are things going on that we don't know much about. If it's happening in the animal populations, in these most contaminated areas where it's really easy to see, you know, the question is, what are we seeing in the other areas where contamination levels are lower, but there are lots of people? Uh, and is, you know, does this imply that there might be long-term health consequences for the human populations as well? And we just need to get at that. And I guess I'll, I'll just stop there. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, 70 years ago, radiation release at that time. Has there been any really comparison of those results? That's a really good question. And so, uh, which points to the, um, which reminds me to uh, mention that the two events are completely different. So, when you drop an atom bomb, uh, first of all, it's a relatively small amount of radioactive material compared to the thousands of tons of radioactive material that were released from Chernobyl in, in, uh, in, in comparable quantities of radioactive materials from Fukushima. Most of the, uh, uh, the, the atom bomb radiation came in the form of an acute external dose. Uh, and, and anybody who was uh, in the, near the center, the epicenter of these bombs, was killed. Uh, and so the only survivors really came from areas where that acute external dose is relatively low uh, compared to you know, some of this. Uh, and, and we are seeing effects, though, of that exposure in terms of increased cancer rates and some evidence for cardiovascular effects uh, and, and other, other effects. But, but they're really two separate kinds of things. Most of this kind of radiation effect from Chernobyl and Fukushima is a result of ingestion the radioactive materials. The cesium is water soluble, it gets in the water, it gets in the food, it gets in the air, you breathe it in. Um, and, and, and it's ongoing, it's chronic all the time if you're living here. Um, thank you, Professor. Uh, I have a question about uh, your study on the consequences of nuclear power um, about, uh, on wildlife. Have you found any uh, kind of animal or species that are more liable to be affected? or what kind of, maybe they have different consequences on different species of life, of wildlife? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a good question. So yes, the answer is yes. We found tremendous variability uh, among different types of groups. So birds and butterflies as groups appear to be particularly sensitive. Yes. Uh, they show the effects immediately, both in Fukushima and in, in Chernobyl. Uh, but even within those groups, we see tremendous variability. There are many bird species that are not affected at all by the contaminants, and other species are quite sensitive. And, and um, we have some ideas as to what you know that difference in sensitivity might reflect. Uh, but, but also within the same species, among individuals of the same species, we see tremendous variation, both in terms of the dose that an individual is picking up uh, in the same place, living in the same place, probably related to the dietary variability. Some you know, individual birds prefer berries, others prefer something else, and, and so you see this reflected in the dose and you see it reflected in the consequences in terms of genetic damage and presumably higher level effects. So tremendous variation. Any difference between uh, male and female birds? <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know, again, we, we see this very large, uh, totally stunning impact on male fertility, uh, spermatogenesis, which we've also seen in human populations, but have written off as being alcoholism primarily. Uh, and, and, um, you know, but at higher doses, it's well known. If, if you have cancer treatment, if you go in for cancer treatment, radiation therapy, one of the first things they tell you is to bank your sperm if you're thinking of you know, continue having a family afterwards, because radiation is well known to affect spermatogenesis but not at this low level of radiation uh, to this extent. Uh, so we see major effects on male fertility, but we also see major effects on female bird survival. Uh, so females are much less likely to survive this exposure than males, but half the survival rate. And we think this reflects reproductive, the cost of reproduction. Females have to make eggs, uh, and mammals they digestate. Uh, there's a lot of maternal care in any species. I think this extra cost of reproduction 
makes them particularly vulnerable to this added stress. <clears throat> I have a quick question for you. Um, you know, once an area has been contaminated, then my understanding is the only way to make it habitable again is you, you know, spray some substance that binds the contamination or you spray a bunch of water to dilute it to the point that it's not harmful. Um, first of all, like, is that correct? And if, you know, in this kind of hypothetical and hypothetical scenario, for example, like uh, you know, the Japanese government put forth a bunch of grant, grant money, a bunch of studies were done in the Fukushima area, and let's say in the future, you know, there's a, a general uh, consensus that you know human habitation or isn't, you know, shouldn't shouldn't be allowed to continue in certain areas. How would how would those areas be recovered eventually? Yeah, is there anything that can be done? So. Um so what, the cesium contamination, cesium is largely water soluble. It does move around with the water. Mm -hmm. That said, it, it tends to bind to the organic and inorganic materials and, and end up in the top layers of the soil. Mm -hmm. It doesn't move nearly as much as we thought it would in the past. And, um, and so the only way to really get rid of it, uh, at a landscape scale at least, is to take the dirt and take, move it. You know, what they're doing is they're removing the, the upper layer of the soil and, and putting it in large bags and burying it in the dump site. And um, uh, the problem in Chernobyl, and this, this sort of worked for Chern Chernobyl, uh, but in Fukushima the problem is, uh, perhaps some of you have been to Japan, the, uh, Japan is mountainous, you know, all of Japan, just about. And so what they've, you know, they've, what they've been doing is scooping the top layer of soil in the rice paddies and the towns, and then, of course, it rains, and the season comes back down. And, and so I think now, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of reflection going on as to the cost effectiveness of removing some of the soil because it's not having nearly as large an impact as they had hoped it would. Um, and a lot of it's got to do with the mobility of the season. The other thing is the season gets into the plants. And, and, and I meant to include a little clip from the newspaper article today, uh, or yesterday, where you know some some crazy person has suggested that they need to basically cut down all the trees in Fukushima and somehow deal with this this massive amount of biomass uh, uh, because the trees are holding on to a lot of this radioactive cesium. In fact, what the trees do is they'll suck it up in the water during the during the you know the growing season, gets trapped into the leaf tissue and the branches, and then the leaves fall to the ground, and so you end up with this recycling of the cesium onto the surface every year. And, and in fact, what they found in Chernobyl is that the, what they call the ecological half-life of, of these radioactive cesium elements is quite a bit longer than expected, on the order of 200 years in Chernobyl, when, whereas the chemical half-life, or the nuclear half-life, is uh, about 30 years. You would have predicted that half of it would be gone, at least half of it would have been gone in 30 years. In many parts of Chernobyl, it's almost as hot as it was, you know, a year after the event, and so um, so it's going to be. It's likely that it's going to be around for a long time. It's unreasonable to suggest that you're going to be able to clear all the trees from an area the size of the Fukushima Prefecture. Mm. You know, what can you do? The only real solution is to not let people live in these contaminated areas. And the groundwater. I mean, how contaminated is that? There? Well, we, we know that the fish in these rivers and streams are very hot in the fall. Um, so uh, the groundwater, uh, we do know that there's very heavily contaminated groundwater seeping into the ocean near where the plant as a result of all the, the runoff. Um, I, you know, again, it depends on what the shape and size of the aquifer is like and whether, you know, the, where it's coming from. But, in Chernobyl, they, there's much less movement than they had predicted through the groundwater. Yes, sir. First of all, just a related comment. USAID had a project in Belarus after Chernobyl where they had identified a certain type of legume that they were planting in fields because a large part of the problem in Belarus is this is an agricultural area and areas have just been blocked out because of contamination. And the idea was the legume, as you said, accumulated this, but it was in the root system. 
and they were then going to harvest, take these aside, put in the disposal area, and after a number of years, what you could do is leach the radiation out of the ground. Fortunately, our relations with Belarus fell off quickly, and we weren't able to continue that project. But you know, that's one example uh, of something that was tried. Related to that, has anybody done any studies in those areas that were exposed, but the exposure was such that the population was allowed? I'm thinking again, Belarus. There's areas where you can't grow crops, but people are still allowed to live there. And then those areas in Europe where we know because of downwind radiation and populations. Any sort of data? Yeah, there's quite a bit. Okay. And uh, most, of, most of the data comes from uh, those kinds of sites, which is simply because uh, there are people there. Uh, so, uh, for instance, in Ukraine, uh, most of the northern part of Ukraine, this area of Galicia, is still populated. We've actually been working uh, in collaboration with some Ukrainian uh, medical practitioners with populations of children living just outside of the exclusion zone uh, in areas that are significantly contaminated. The, the, the external dose is not high, but because they grow their own food, uh, they're getting significant internal doses as a result of, again, chronic uh, input from, from the food and water. And uh, we're, you know, all sorts of unusual maladies, morbidities associated with this in direct proportion to the predicted exposure. Uh, in the last few years, we've been getting much better data for dose rates in these children as well. And so the data are tightening up. Uh, as you say, in Belarus, actually, the government was actively promoting the rehabilitation of these lands and promoting agriculture. So we, one of the reasons we moved to uh, Belarus to do some of our work in Belarus was so that we could compare yeah. both inhabited and uninhabited areas of about equal contamination levels, uh, you know, where the birds might, some of the, some of the species are actually, you know, commensal with human populations. So, so they're doing quite, you know, there's, there's more of them in Belarus in some of these areas where there's cows and people. And so we can compare both the effects of radiation and the effects of commensalism uh, simultaneously, compare and contrast, and to see if this, you know, what the driving underlying factors might be. Uh, and, and so there's quite a bit of work coming out of Belarus, mainly by the Japanese, ironically, who are quite interested in this, in this topic uh, prior to Fukushima as well, uh, primarily from a, you know, a atomic bomb survivor's perspective. Um, it, it's, you know, one of the, the problems in Chernobyl has been that the first five years following the event was under Soviet rule, and it was effectively illegal to conduct basic research related to Chernobyl effects. And so there was very little done. There were several people exiled, uh, certainly people who were moved uh, to other positions who, you know, they basically you would, you would not permitted to conduct research. Uh, and so the research that was done by government scientists was largely top secret, not published, not available. We haven't seen it. Uh, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, the economic situation being what it was, there was no money for research. And so even those who might have wanted to do research didn't get a whole lot done. Uh, you know, our co collaborators in Ukraine don't have cars, let alone the ability to set up an experimental design in Chernobyl. They can't even get to Chernobyl from Kiev, 60 miles away, because there's no money uh, to support that. So we were the first ones to get in there to do any real research on birds and insects. There's been some other people doing work on small mammals, but uh, there just really wasn't much work done on the ecological side. So when Fukushima happened, we knew how important it was. The, 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 base, the bottom line is we missed all those early years of exposure. So we don't know what happened in Fukushima or Chernobyl as a result of, of the event in those early years. But Fukushima hit, we knew that it was really important to get in there as quick as possible to catch these early generations to see what the time course, the longitudinal effects might be. And uh, we thought there would be plenty of research dollars, lots of funding to do this, of course there hasn't been. Uh, in fact, we're seeing the same sorts of responses. Uh, you know, if, if you don't want to know the answer to a question, don't ask it. Don't ask it. And, and, and of course, don't fund it, is, is what really happens. Most scientists are like plumbers. You know, they're not going to come fix your plumbing if you don't pay them. You know? and, and so, uh, you know, they follow the money. And so the best way to not 
get an answer to a question. It's just don't put any research money out there. Uh, and you know, there, there are a few people who can who can find alternative pathways like we've done, but but most can't. And so this this is problematic. I think. I've got a good follow-up question to that. You're talking about uh, your your research. Now, my question is. Uh, do you see your research and your findings having having an impact on energy policy? These future these future projects that you mentioned at the beginning of your of your presentation, do you see your findings impacting how whether people choose to use this type of energy? That's the question I was expecting. <laughs> That's good. Uh, you know, funnily enough, you know, I, I, as an evolutionary biologist, I never ever expected anything that we would do would have any impact on, on any kind of policy. Uh, but, uh, curiously enough, uh, it, it, we've been getting a lot of, been a lot of interest out of some of the regulatory uh, agent, uh, bodies like ICRP, the International Radiation Protection Group of Canada, it's an international group that, that makes recommendations concerning uh, exposures to human populations from, from radiation. Uh, I know that they are considering changes to their policies of acceptable doses uh, as a result of the Chernobyl work, not just ours, but, but a number of other groups. In fact, there was a review just uh, last year by a group out of France who had in the past been very critical of our work in particular, but, but also uh, uh, suggesting that there would be minimal effects of Chernobyl and Fukushima-like doses to animal populations because you know, insects are supposed to be really tough and resistant to this stuff. And what they did after, what they found after a review of all this data was that populations living in natural conditions, experiencing the full range of environmental stress, are eight to ten times more sensitive than any of the previous models had predicted. So the models of the International Atomic Energy Agency, ICRP, uh, it's clear that they're not nearly as uh, sensitive as they should be. Uh, it had been thought in the past that if you protect an environment, if you protect from man, that you will by default protect the environment. Uh, this has been sort of you know, one of the mantras. And it's very clear that that's not true. Uh, we're seeing major injuries to these, these ecosystems, uh, in part because they are much more sensitive than we'd ever thought. And, and this appears to be influencing policy. You didn't mention that Yucca Mountain specifically, but you're talking about, you know, kind of generally U.S. Uh, nuclear reactor policy. But, you know, I've, I've heard from a number of geologists that Yucca Mountain actually has been geologically active in the last, you know, 20,000 years, some along, some along those lines. So if, if it, in your opinion, is that a good place to store all the collective, you know, spent fuel rods in the United States, or is there another place that'd be more ideal? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a real hot topic, isn't it? Uh, no the, uh, no, and th this is, a, of course, this has been the main issue in terms of relicensing and, and new uh, permits for nuclear power plant construction. Uh, that that's the holdup at the moment. Is, you know, what do we do with the spent fuel? Uh, Yucca Mountain, uh, you know. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a, an expert. It, it's clear that there are uh, seismic and volcanically related issues in the area. Um, it, it, you know, again, at this point in time, you know, forget about Yucca Mountain. We can't even solve the issue of of how to package up the spent fuel in a way that renders it harmless on a long time period on a long time scale. So, you know, a dry cask storage is the most popular method at the moment, uh, but that has a limited lifespan as well of you know, maybe 15, maybe 100 years maximum. Uh, some of the older technology, not even that, mm -hmm. so we're going to have to be continuously repackaging that. Um, transportation, transport of this stuff, you know, how, do we, how do we transport it in a way that ensures that it's not going to be subject to some accident and spill? Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a handle on, on a lot of these technologies. That's why I, I tell many of my students and, and my engineering students that um, nuclear, you know, despite this lack of major renaissance activity that they've been predicting in terms of new construction, nuclear will be a good field to be in for a long period of time, if only on the environmental side. Uh, the transport and storage uh, and potential 
you know, environmental impacts of nuclear will be with us for a very long time. So that's, that's a good area to invest in and to study. If you can come up with a solution for the packaging and storage of nuclear fuel, you could become very rich. Uh, how is it done on site right now? Just I guess most well, two ways. You know, a lot of it, an awful lot of it, is just spent. Spent. Sorry, <laughs> I've been running nonstop in this week. The uh, a lot of it's just stored in uh, in fuel ponds and, and, and cooling ponds uh, on site. And it's just stacked up in the water until mm -hmm. it cools down. It takes uh, varying amounts of time, but a year or two. At least, but most of it's in those cooling ponds because that's the easiest thing to deal with, mm -hmm. uh, the cheapest thing to do. Uh, some of it gets, um, when those cool, cooling ponds get filled up, they take some of those rods and in some places they are putting them into this dry cask storage, which is basically a, a concrete type uh, of, of when it's cool enough, they can encase it in concrete in this big block and sort of wind them up like uh, these little concrete balls. Mm -hmm. uh, Side and that's supposed to provide enough security to keep them from being blown up or to really it keeps them from releasing additional radiation. Mm -hmm. and you said for between 15 to 100 years, yeah. that's kind of so you know, I, again, I'm not an expert in, in that area at all. And um, but one of the messages I've been hearing is that that's not a permanent solution, mm -hmm. that it's really uh, will require repackaging mm -hmm. at regular intervals uh, because the material just doesn't hold up. Yeah. I guess my real question is, you know, once you've reached, let's say it's 15 years to the threshold, and you've, you've dry cast some storage, I mean, would you just take another, you put that inside another concrete box essentially 15 years later? And I'm presuming, I, like I said, I, I don't know. But perhaps we have an expert. No, no, not on that. Uh, but just related, you may have heard a couple of days ago, they had another partial collapse at Chernobyl. Another one? Yeah. And, uh, you know, the Europeans who are trying to build the new sarcophagus said it wouldn't affect the, you know, you and I both know they've been delaying on that because of lack of funding. And um, you know, so aside from just the fuel, but here's a case where we have an active site and we still can't get this stuff in. So 27 years later, at Chernobyl, uh, almost $2 billion in investments, and they still can't, they still don't know how much unspent fuel is sitting in the bottom of the reactor building because they haven't been able to get into it uh, because it's too, too radioactive and it's filled with water. And, and you know, one of the concerns with Chernobyl is because a lot of these uranium oxides move with the water, they're water soluble. Mm -hmm. and, and so if the water is sort of seeping down through the bottom, you could accumulate enough of this highly radioactive U-235 fissionable material to actually go critical, critical mass. And, 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 and cause an explosion. And, and, and this is what they this is the argument they've been using to get more and more investments to rebuild this new covering. And, and the whole point of this new cover, which they're having to build over here because it's too radioactive there, they build it here, it's on rails, and they'll just sort of wheel it over and place it over top of the old building. Uh, the main reason for that new structure is actually to keep the water out so that the building will dry down. So the, the basement will dry down enough so that they can get in to figure out where all this spent fuel is. Of course, one of the one of the potential hazards of that is once that water sort of seeped out and dried, you may get this critical mass in some areas. <laughs> and and so now though, what they're finding is that the sarcophagus, this temporary structure of concrete and lead that was built originally after the original event, is starting to fall apart. And and there was a there was big news a month or two ago when the first, there was a segment, how big, it was huge. Uh, yeah. one, one section of this concrete <coughs> structure fell over yeah. and, uh, and everybody sort of stopped working, reassessed, and everybody decided that it wasn't affecting radiation levels, it wasn't a hazard to the workers, and so they started back to work. But you're saying another sec section this fell over. Probably yeah, no, it's a, uh, 27 years later, they still haven't been able to figure that out. You know, Fukushima was a much larger disaster in terms of structural damage. Uh, these, these spent fuel ponds, which are storing the pools where the spent fuel is sitting in Fukushima, are 100 feet above the ground. And these structures that are right now very vulnerable to further seismic activity. And should there be another earthquake, uh, 
much smaller than the original uh, would be enough to knock this building over and spend fuel to drop on the ground and to see another major release. So these are the concerns. In, in Japan, are they storing stuff locally as well, too? Is yes. Okay. Everywhere, as far as I know. Thank you very much. We well, appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Very fascinating. Any, any of you who want any pictures of deformed animals? <laughs> 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 Still food and stuff left, so help yourselves. Thanks for coming. For the SFS Asian Studies Program at Georgetown University. This has been another installment of the Spotlight Asia podcast. To find more podcasts like this one, visit our website at aspmedia.org.